patents, trademarks, and copyright. Prepared for and presented at the 2018 Square One Entrepreneurship Training Program. Square One is a program of the Center for Emerging Technologies. CET is an affiliate of the Cortex Innovation Community. Square One is funded in part by the Missouri Technology Corporation. We're going to give you kind of a high-level overview of intellectual property. Uh, as mentioned, it includes copyrights, trademarks, and patents. Um, hopefully, some of you who've been in the process, I encourage questions during my presentation. Um, it is a very dense uh, subject matter, so uh, I didn't give you a whole lot in the slides. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them, and we can certainly follow up later in the break or anything like that. Um, but this will hopefully, at the end of this, help you recognize you know, intellectual property. Whether you plan on seeking a patent or not, uh, all of you will probably touch intellectual property in some way, shape, or form, whether it's trademark for your company name, um, which revolves around the goods or services you produce. So if you don't make anything, if you're going to provide a service, uh, you'll eventually want to build up goodwill within that so people identify your company uh, as doing it better than someone else. Um, early on, you also want to you know, consider avoiding other people's IPs. Uh, typically, uh, other intellectual property, typically most people only focus on securing their own. Uh, part of my day is helping people avoid someone else. So, you know, early on, you pick the right company name so you don't have an issue down the road when you want to expand and you find out someone else is using a similar mark in the same field. Um, if you do have, and we'll briefly go over some of the different options, costs, timelines, processes. And uh, if you do have employees or people working with you, whether they are employees or independent contractors, some things to consider and think about uh, in your dealing with them. So what is intellectual property? Obviously, any know-how it obtained from problem solving. Um, again, you're creating something, you're improving on something. Uh, it can be you're doing it better. Um, I also added purposeful creativity. So this does get towards trademarks, uh, copyright, any copywritten information that you provide. Um, you're trying to design something uh, using your creativity that's better than what's existing now. So obviously, intellectual property is another form of property, is an asset, as Gita mentioned, that you can uh, sell at, with, with your company. Um, obviously, real property you may be familiar with, land, buildings, physical products you can own, but IP is similar. Uh, you may only have a, a piece of paper to show for it, but there is a lot of value and goodwill built in behind it. Uh, just some examples, other than patents, we do have trademarks, uh, service marks, uh, you'll see the circle C, uh, for copyrights, circle R, for registered trademarks, and just another example of a, a trademark. Uh, again, these are some of the many different forms of IP protection that we'll briefly discuss. Um, and again, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, so we'll kind of start with, with uh, we'll actually start with, with copyright. It is what we call the simplest to obtain. Um, most people do it themselves. If, if you need a, a service provider or professional's help, we'll at least guide you through it. Um, then we'll move to trademarks, a little bit on domain names, trade secrets, and patents. Uh, I myself am a patent attorney. That's what I do 85 to 90% of the time, uh, helping my clients secure patents or defending their patent or making sure they're not infringing someone else's patent. Um, so just a quick survey. Is anyone here in the process of getting a trademark or patent or anything like that? Okay. Uh, so the point of IP protection is you know, to protect yourself against your competitors. IP can work both as a sword and a shield. So as a shield, you want to protect yourself against the pet your competitors, keep them from doing something, as we'll discuss later with patents. Some IP rights are what we call negative rights, which means you have the ability to stop someone else from doing it. Um, you may not necessarily be able to do it yourself. We'll get to that, but at least you can stop others from doing it. Uh, another consideration is non-infringement. You want to make sure well, what your competitors are doing, you're not going to infringe that and have them reaching out to you at some point in the future. Uh, we'll discuss, as I mentioned, the costs and geographic considerations. Uh, some of you may consider going international, your long-term business plans, and there are certain procedures you need to be thinking about now, um, particularly with patent protection, um, whereas if you plan to stay in the U.S. only, there are different steps and procedures to consider. So. So first, starting with copyright, as you mentioned, it's an original work of authorship, fixed and tangible medium. So if you just 
blurt something out right now, you don't necessarily, it's not, you can't get that copywritten, but if you fix it in a tangible medium, whether it's recorded, written down, put on your website, uh, you can. Typically people think of literary works, dramatic works, music. Um, currently now software is, is a big uh, piece of IP that people are protecting. Um, as I mentioned, it has to be fixed in a tangible medium, so as soon as you write it down, you create it. There are common law copyright rights, so as soon as you write something down on your page, set up a web page, uh, you do have certain protections. Uh, in common law, those are typically local, uh, limited geographic regions, so maybe the bi-state area, maybe Missouri, surrounding states. Uh, it certainly wouldn't protect you against someone on the coast. However, we do have federal copyright registration, which does give you national protection, and there is the presumption um, that if someone, you at least have a good case to bring case against someone copying, using what you're using in those other jurisdictions. Um, and again, there's all sorts of details. If any of you have heard of fair use, things like that, we can certainly get into that if you have any questions. Uh, as mentioned, uh, copyrights, they have a pretty long lifetime, 70 years. Um, this was increased primarily due to uh, Walt Disney and his, lobby, his estate and lobbying efforts to increase copyright. That's why a lot of the original Disney works are still protected and not in the, common, in the public domain. Uh, as Dita mentioned, works made for hire. So the copyright belongs in the author. Whoever wrote it, created it, they have the copyright in it. So if your employee writes software for you, technically they are the author, they would have the copyright protection. Hopefully you either have it in an employment agreement or some other agreement with them that what they do is a work made for hire. Uh, this is particular key if you're using independent contractors, if you're outsourcing to have a, someone develop your website or write software for you. You want to make sure that it's clear that this is a work made for hire so that you, your company, will own the copyright in that work. Um, any, any questions regarding that? All right. So moving on, the next form of trademark, that's something that nearly everyone will encounter. That is actually any word, name, sound, symbol, or device, combination thereof, that identifies a source of goods or services. Uh, the key being the source. So when you see a t-shirt, even if there's a logo on the front, the trademark is really on the tag that you can say that this is the company that produced this good and that's where it comes from. Um, you can have sound trademarks, you can have, there are some smell trademarks. Uh, I looked into it and there's actually uh, Verizon has a smell trademark for when you walk in their stores. I've never noticed it, but if, if anyone goes in there, there's supposed to be a particular smell in Verizon stores and they were able to get a trademark on that. Uh, it is described as a flowery, flowery musk scent. So, yeah. <laughs> so, is that a question? Yes. So I was maybe a little bit more attuned to that. Mm -hmm. I swear there is a McDonald's soap smell that I've never smelled anywhere on the over market, and it seems very consistent with their branding mm -hmm. to the extent that if I wash my hands at a McDonald's and I don't smell that smell, I'm wondering if the event of that particular franchisee is kind of trying to pull a fast one. <laughs> but uh, you know, like you think about something like that that is readily noticeable, like soap. Uh -huh. You can definitely see where that communicates a part of the whole experience. That is correct. Some of but the I, other. I really thought of that though. That's that's bizarre. Yeah, it, it's been new to me. There's other. There's a, a scented toothbrush that came out, and and you know part of their IP protection was the, the it was a strawberry scent for using the, this toothbrush. Um, it's not very common, but if that's what you want to protect. Yes. That is correct, and they would do that, but for the, their trademark protection would actually be, if they made the shirt, it depends who's making the shirt, so they have, you know, they would license the use of their mark on to whatever t-shirt manufacturer is making it, and you're relying that Nike's gonna use a good vendor to, 
produce their shirts. Now, hopefully they're not gonna you know, fall apart on you. But the person that actually produced the shirt, you know, if you look at the tag, that's where their mark will be. So it's, it's whenever people wanna market you know, their goods, we let them know that you know, if you wanna show us how you're using your mark, it should be on the, the tag of the item that you're using. So just putting your company logo on a shirt, you know, you wouldn't necessarily protect. Uh, that would not be a, a good example of your use, your logo in use, because unless you're a shirt manufacturer, then you're really just, you know, providing a product, but you want to show how you're using, or some product that you use with your mark on it. So whatever you're doing, if you're providing a service, so it's most likely a website. Uh, like I said, if you do sell a good, then seeing it on the packaging of that good in the store is what you would want to do. So what would you recommend then for, for, for um, trademarking? Like if you, if the, whatever's on the front isn't on the tag, then how do you protect the whatever's on the front? Well, your, your, your trademark would be in your business that, you, that you're doing, and that shirt would be to further that, the goodwill of that. So as I said, unless you're a t-shirt manufacturer, you know, it, it's a good marketing tool but you want to build your trademark in whatever you're doing. So if you're providing some other service or making something else, you want to build that up and you know, the t-shirt will help you get your name out there, but your, your core focus and the value in it is going to be the business behind that that you're making. Um, so a trademark and you file it, it, is, it has an initial 10 year term, which is renewed every 10 years. Um, it's, you know, in, in perpetuity as long as you're using it. Um, the key for trademark protection is a likelihood of confusion with consumers. So you'll see people with similar marks, but they're in different goods or classes. Um, so you can have trademark A that sells software, uh, trademark B over here is making swimsuits. And there's very little likelihood that someone purchasing a swimsuit is gonna think this comes from the software manufacturer and vice versa. Um, however, when you get to larger uh, companies, there can be some overlap, it's kind of, so Amazon is a service mark and a trademark, or excuse me, it's a service mark and a, and a trademark for goods that they produce branded in their name. So if they start producing something that they sell, you know, there's likelihood of confusion that what you're buying comes from them or some other entity. Their service mark is for web services, um, so you want to really just think about those when you're uh, picking your mark and moving forward, but it's, it's the goodwill behind the company is ultimately what uh, it provides value for trademarks. Um, i trying to think of a good example of uh, confusion. Um, well, if any of you, it's, it's fictitious, but if you've seen Coming to America, the movie, McDonald's versus McDowell's, um, and how uh, Mr. McDowell bends over backwards to show the differences, um, that is something where if you look at it, they're so close, they're in the same industry, most consumers will likely be confused and it, it's, it's kind of hard to predict that. When you get into litigation, there's, you conduct surveys, you speak to all sorts of people, so it's, a, it's a hard to predict how a jury would rule on that. So we tend to, entrepreneurs tend to identify four or five, maybe more names that they want to go forward, and we would do a search. You know, this name, this brand is, or this mark is not used in this category of goods and services. You have a greater likelihood of succeeding with it or we'll let you know this is pretty close to something else in a similar industry, so there's a good chance that it would fail. Yes? Um, uh, public policy, just to make sure people are using it so that you don't get a trademark, make some products go out of business and have, you know, force uh, prevent anyone else from using it. Um, so again, these are, you know, just some trademarks identified, obviously Amazon, United Airlines, Southwest Airlines, those are both, well, the airlines are primarily service providers, tra you know, traveling, uh, transporting people around the country. Um, if they sell goods, you know, their branded material or anything else, they could also be uh, goods providers. Um, you can, as I mentioned, you have a sound, so if you've heard the ding, you're free to, the, for, free to travel around the country. That is a sound mark that's owned by Southwest Airlines. Um, same thing with the NBC chimes that they play before shows. Um, if you just hear that in isolation with a television show um, and you're not NBC, they would have a cause of action against you. So. 
Um, we'll talk briefly about trade secret, and this ties into patents we'll get into in a minute. Um, but as Keith mentioned, any information that provides economic value to your company um, that's not in the public domain and you have to take efforts to keep it secret. So uh, the Coca-Cola secret and KFC's 11 Urban Spices at one point in time, they probably still are, you know, in safes, in the CEO's office. Uh, I think Coca-Cola says neither the CEO or, nor the um, next in line can be on the airplane at the same time. There's all sorts of uh, different rules that people have in place to protect the secret and no one has access to the room and things like that. So for, for most of you, just simply limiting who has access to it, storing it in a secure location, um, signing NDAs for anyone you work with, taking reasonable efforts to, to keep that information secure will instill trade secret protection in what you're doing. Yes? Question. So once you become trademark, does that protect you from social media as well? Or how does that work? Well, people can use uh, your trademark if they're using it correctly. So if they're using it to identify your company or your source, your, your service, then it's... Can they register, like, for instance, like on Instagram, if you are Nike, can they register your name as on Instagram or Twitter? Because I've had that happen to me. Like, uh, <laughs> Uh, no, they, well, in theory, they no, they should not unless they're using it. Um, it it's similar to the squatting with domain names. Um, so the, the courts are allowing people who have a vested interest in that name or that mark to reclaim uh, anyone who squatted and said, I'm going to, at the beginning of the internet, you know, trade or secure the rights for Ford.com um, before Ford really had an online presence and then hold it for hostage. Yeah, and, right. They were uh, charged. So um, if they are actually using it, um, I, mean, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. But, I mean, if, if it's, they're simply doing it to extort someone else, a, a more senior user, then courts would look unfavorably on that. Um, but if they've developed on their own and they're trying to market or sell a product uh, that uses that, um, it's, it's, you know, we'd, we'd have to take a closer look at it. And it's hard to give a straight answer for that one, but um, yes. So, like some companies this used to come in words like Apple. Mm -hmm. We always talk about Apple all the time. Mm -hmm. So, I assume how can they trademark at least trade on their own companies? Or? Uh, so, when Apple began, they um, initially they were limited to computers and software. There was also an, an Apple Music in, in England, and. Once you uh, register a trademark, uh, and I did not provide this in this handout, but Gita did, you'll see that there's a, a sliding continuum of trademark strength going from generic and descriptive all the way up to arbitrary and fanciful. So if you just have a generic name, you sell vacuums, you call your company Vacuum Co., they'll say that's generic and you most likely won't get protection for it. You go all the way to a made up word like Kodak, um, Google to some extent, even though it's, it's a real word. Um, you have stronger protection in that. So even if you do use a relatively weak trademark, you try to acquire what they call secondary meaning, which means you've built up your company and the goodwill behind that mark to a certain point that when anyone hears it, they're going to associate it with you and there's little likelihood of confusion. So anyone hears Apple with electronics, they're going to think of the company in Cupertino, California. Uh, until iTunes, Apple Music was just the company in England and they've since had litigation, since Apple got into the music business, of you know whether that's allowable. So um, we we caution or we recommend that you try to start at the arbitral of, or fanciful mark. So we just make up a word. Um, if you really want to pick something that's close to your business, then we try to suggest pairing it with a logo, drawing something else uh, to give it some distinctive qualities. Mm -hmm. uh, it can, um, but as I said, the, the value of a trademark is in the goodwill behind it. So if, like I said, your, your company is well known and people it can instantly recognize that trademark associated with you, that has great value. Um, so, okay. um, so again, getting back to trade secrets, you protect formulas, patterns, 
anything that has economic value to you. Uh, and again, it'll last as long as it remains secret. Um, so just ask yourselves, you know, what would hurt my business if it gets out, whether it's customer list, supplier list, um, if you're making some sort of conco concoction, if, you're, if you make perfumes or scented candles, the exact ratios of the parts you're using, uh, the suppliers who you get the components for, uh, that sort of information. You know, in theory, they're all publicly available, but the manner in which you're using them could be a secret only to you, and you want to maintain that uh, amongst yourselves or anyone who's working with you. Uh, it's another list, you know, the software you're using internally, uh, reference materials, supplier lists, strategies, uh, things of that nature. If you, if you certainly have any questions or whether it's something you have could be a, a trade secret, you feel free to ask. So go through a few at the end of this and maybe we'll see. Uh, someone that breaches that, there are um, certain actions that you may have, whether at the state level uh, or the federal level. Um, but again, we, we recommend NDAs for uh, everyone you're dealing with, if it's an independent contractor or a third party you're working with, uh, to try to protect the information that is important to you. Um, this gets into some defenses of trade secrets. So there is a prior use defense. If someone acquires the knowledge on their own or they have been using it, you may not have a cause of action against them. Um, but we recommend you, you you know, keep track of this information yourself when you've started doing something, uh, whether it's on an invention disclosure form or what other notes you may have, just keep track of dates and, and times when you're using this information. Uh, now we're gonna get into patents. Uh, as I mentioned, that's you know, my primary practice. Uh, you can acquire a patent for any process, a machine, Article of manufacture, composition method of matter, um, processes mean methods. So whether it's you actually physically doing something or business methods, which um, have become certainly popular lately in the past uh, 15 years or so, um, and then there's you know a whole other lot of case law behind that we can get into. But the key important features are they have to be new and useful. So novelty, something no one's done before, it's not in public domain. Useful, there is a practical use to it. Um, that's typically eliminate certain things as perpetual motion machines and things like that that can't exist. Um, and it has to be non-obvious. So that, for people seeking patent protection, tends to be one of the hardest concepts to understand, and even as practitioners, the, the hardest to deal with because the patent office can say there's no one particular patent or product doing what you're doing, but it would be obvious to combine it with this other patent to come up with yours. So if you're improving on something, you know, the examiner starts with what you're improving on and just find some other reference that kind of would lead someone to make your invention. So, uh, historically, Did yes. Applications for that? Uh, yes, so briefly in the patent process, if, if you have never done it, when you file a patent application, uh, it is examined uh, at the patent office. An examiner will read the claims, which are where you're laying out the boundaries around my invention. They'll do their own search and say, no, here's another patent that teaches the exact same thing, that's one rejection, or as I mentioned, they'll find one that's as most of it, they'll find others, and, and hopefully they can make a plausible argument that it would have been obvious for someone skilled in this industry, this <coughs> art, to combine the two, and they will issue a rejection. So my job as a patent practitioner is to review that rejection, review what we've disclosed, look at prior art references, and, and argue against it, that you know, no one would combine these, this doesn't teach what you're saying it, it teaches, uh, similar things like that. So then we go back to the patent office and that's the back and forth that, that takes place until the patent office hopefully will say, all right, you know, you have a new and useful invention that we're gonna grant you a patent. Uh, some exceptions to getting a patent, uh, abstract ideas, so mathematical algorithms, uh, laws of nature, you can't patent gravity. You can patent a machine that uses gravity, but you can't patent gravity itself. Um, natural phenomena, so if any of you are familiar with the Myriad case of uh, Myriad tried to protect or tried to patent allegedly the breast cancer gene, uh, that was one that was fought heavily in the courts and, and ultimately the end decision is while they, they can't patent the gene itself as it exists in nature, but their patent is directed towards a purified uh, version of it, 
which ultimately has value because research institutions would rather have that and work with that. So in one sense, they do have kind of a monopoly on that area of research, but they do not own the genes in anyone's body, anything like that. Yes? Um, what's, is, is there a specific thing behind why algorithms are accepted to uh, It's just a mathematical property. They don't want someone to try to uh, co-opt and, and, and limit an entire uh, or an existing mathematical property um, as a matter of public policy. So you can, divine, you can design an invention that makes use of that algorithm, um, that, work, that you know, has an input and output and uses that algorithm to change data or determine some data, but they just don't want you to you know, say that you're gonna, you have a claim for this uh, algorithm and forestall everyone else from using it. So uh, patent law itself, I didn't mention, is, is actually in the Constitution. Um, as something that our forefathers thought of to promote science. So the trade-off you make with a patent is you tell the world how you're gonna do it and the government's gonna give you a 20-year monopoly. Um, so that's the trade-off you make and as I mentioned, when we get the trade secrets later, or for, again, you'll see sometimes when you get a patent application, you don't tell every single thing you're doing. You tell enough that someone who's familiar with the industry could recreate what you're doing. There's still some information you may want to obtain a secret. Uh, to some extent, gen generic drugs, that again is a public policy to you know, promote general health and further development. So uh, generic drug manufacturers can rely on some of their work, the health, da health data by the company at Pfizer, whoever made it the first time, and they're only allowed to produce the generic towards the tail end of the patent. Um, but at the, at the uh, you know, they, they still want to make sure that, that Pfizer or whoever creates it can recoup uh, their investment. So. Um, and they really just have to, generic drugs have to prove that they're using the same uh, materials that'll function the same way as, as the and brand name drug. Them, yes, that, that's true. So that's, that's a common uh, point that's litigated now. A lot of generics, you know, kind of riding the coattails, but, and maybe that'll be a whole other discussion on pharmaceutical <laughs> drugs, but yes. Uh, it would be copyright. copyright. So, right. uh -huh. um, but, okay. So, what I'm trying to figure out is like virtual machines. Mm -hmm. and, like, is there, a, is there a line between you know, what parts, like, or certain pieces of what's written code could be patented? Okay. So, software and like uh, uh, many other things we'll discuss can be covered by multiple forms of uh, IP protection. So, the software. If you get a copyright on software code, you're actually getting a protection for the written code as it's written out on in machine readable or human readable text, so all the different lines after they've been compiled. In the patent sense, what you're trying to protect is a either a process, a method of going through these steps, or a product, a, a machine that performs what the software does, or a uh, product if you they're not as popular now, but they used to be computer readable mediums, so the at one time the CD that had the software on it or even the flash drive. So you can protect software using patent uh, protection, but you're really getting to the method, the steps that are performed in that sense. Yes. There are, and there's, there's trade-offs. So if you seek to copyright the code, obviously there's you know, multiple ways to, uh, to uh, perform the same function using various computer languages. So there is some limited value in getting copyright on the code. Um, there is some value, but it may be limited. With patent, your ultimate goal is you're trying to prote protect the functionality or the machine that performs it, such that no matter what code it's written in, you know, if, if I make a machine that does steps A, B, and C, and you do make one that makes A, B, and C, and I have a patent, you would infringe my patent regardless of what language you use to, to achieve those end goals. So, so really, you're trying to Yeah, yeah, to some extent. I mean, ultimately, it's, it's the process of, of what you're doing. So whether it is, you know, if the output is the end goal or even it's just a matter of 
Um, say identifying a problem, I, I take these inputs, I make some calculations, and I you know, make another decision based on that. Um, the goal of the patent is to try to protect that process of doing that. And there are other fine distinctions as to we'll get into, of, you know, is that enough? Does there have to be another step that is acted upon? Um, so it's, as, as I mentioned, it's, it's a, a constantly evolving field, certainly between uh, software and, and quote unquote business methods. So that's, that's a common thing we're running into someone who's operating a, a, or develops a web app or is running a business that's web based. They're trying to capture what normally had been done by hand with you know, pencil and paper, but you're making it more efficient obviously on the computer. So the way we prepare the application and draft the claims to protect that um, are very important so that we, the patent office doesn't say, no, you're just trying to do what people have been doing for 100 years, on, only you're adding a computer. We're trying to show, no, this is actually a new inventive process that someone's come up with. Yes? I have a question. I suppose uh, I know a lot of tech, but if you go to the research side, a lot of publication related to these and also some patents, but it's never done in existence. There's no product there. So you suppose I develop for things and I develop that uh, I can produce this, and I talk to a uh, equipment manufacturer that can do this idea and see it. If they're successful, do they have a right to sell the equipment to any of my competitor? Because their job is to sell the equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a common lawyer answer is to say it depends, which in this case it does. So, um, uh, first thing I tell clients is even if you don't see a product on the market, it hasn't, you know, widely well known. Doesn't mean someone hasn't filed a patent application for it. Um, it may not have been patented. They, there may be other reasons they didn't get one, but they, at least they've, you know, tried the process. So, uh, on the first end, it could be the patent office could think that there is this information is out there, and you would not be able to get a patent because they're going to argue that what you're trying to do is not new. It's not novel. Um, the second would be if they're, they don't find art and they, they go through and say, yes, you could get a patent. Um, as we'll uh, get to in a minute, a, a patent is a negative right. So it gives you the right to prevent other people from making the software. It doesn't necessarily give you the right to make it. So there could be, if you come up with a product that has uh, four parts, A, B, C, and D. I could have a patent for a product that has A, B, and C. So now you have a new product because you've added you know, element D, but you need my three to practice yours. So it, uh, that could be the case as to why you're not free to, to sell uh, your patent, because there, there could be you know, a patent there that either wasn't identified or, or you know, we'd have to look at it closely. But um, in theory, if something is in the public domain and is not uh, protectable by patent, in theory, you could be able to sell it but you would not be able to stop anyone else from doing it because you do not have a patent yourself. Um, so likely a patent office, they would find the art that's similar, and in order to get your patent and your claims, you would really point out what's novel, what you think is new and not existing already. <laughs> so the patent office would consider that and look at your claim language, and so when they get to what we'll, we'll consider background or the base of your patent, if there's other art, they'll, they'll, they'll rely on that. And if they can find something that teaches this new piece you've developed, 
and they can make a plausible argument that where it's taught is, is related, such that someone in your industry would consider that, um, their, their first action would be to reject your claims and say your invention is obvious because someone skilled in your art has already done the base and they're adding, you're just adding something new that someone else in the, sim in the same art has discussed over here. So unfortunately, the patent office imparts upon inventors knowledge of everything in the world. So they can you know, assume that you have knowledge of all of these things, which you know, it's, it's certainly not practical, but it, it is just an assumption that they can make. So part of our job, as I mentioned, would be to look at these two references clearly and show, well, no, one of the skilled would not combine this third art because it says certain language that if you try to combine it, theirs wouldn't work. So as as you know, engineer, whoever building this, you would say, no, these really teach different things. There's enough reason why someone would not combine these, and I've developed a reason why you would, so I have a new invention. Um, so that, that's, that's the short answer. Obviously, you know, we'd have to look at the details of, of what is taught in, in the different references, um, but uh, there, there's, in most art areas we'd say are pretty crowded. Uh, a patent can, be, as I mentioned, can be a sword and a shield. So when you draft a patent application, there's a written description which, which describes your invention. Um, one thing we try to do is perhaps maybe think of some changes you might make, some tweaks, some potential um, developments you might make because the, the process can take several years to grant. Um, and so, or you, you may put in stuff that you just don't want anyone else to do. I know I'm not gonna add part D, but I wanna put it out there to stop someone else from adding part D. Um, and then there's the claims, which are like the fence around your property that is examined and that's what tells the world if you ever wanna sue someone for infringing your patent, they have to do what is in the claims of your patent. So the claims will be narrower than your written description. Um, but we have to consider both from a patentability standpoint of whether you can get a patent versus whether you can practice your patent in view of what else is out there. Yes? Uh, one of your lists up here under subject matter is processes, processes and methods. Mm -hmm. If you take something that is off the shelf, that is, for example, um, a part that is sold as, as a plumbing. Mm -hmm. Find an electrical use for that. Is that patentable? It's a new use. Uh, new uses on themselves, typically no. Um, not unless your new use, as I as I mentioned, is is you know so new or non obvious that you have you hopefully you would have to do something. Mm -hmm. um, but if it you could just take part A and use it over here, part B you would not get that. If there was something about its use in plumbing. Um, that yeah, I've heard about I love PVC. It's not yeah. conductive yeah. transformer. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So no, in that instance, it just taking a, a PVC part that you know was used to transport water or some other fluid and using it as a to hold conduit uh, would not be patentable. Now, if you had to do some of the process, coding it, change it, do something else, that potentially could be patentable. Okay. Um, or if for some reason there was prevailing knowledge, everyone said there's no way in the world you'd ever use PVC as an insulator over here and, mm -hmm. or and, uh -huh. and you somehow show that you can and it works, then you, you have, certainly have a stronger case to prove it's not obvious um, because you're going against conventional wisdom, but uh, simply taking it off the shelf and using that it for a new use. Yeah. <laughs> Something similar happens in the drug business though all the time, so that's the business I'm in. So, you know, companies frequently will discover a new use for an existing composition of matter, and I believe they can get a method of use claim on that. Is that correct? Yes. Now, pharmaceuticals is, uh, I, I don't practice it, but I know it is a completely different uh, bear in that sense. And really, when you ultimately get down to, it's my understanding, into uh, the besides chemical chemical composition, uh, some of the different uh, molecular shapes and structures. Uh, and I think more often than not, you may find people were sure it wouldn't do that. And here we are showing that it can do that. Um, but in, in general, for, for most uh, products, a new use without some modification, unless there is some strong reason that people came out and said you could never do this, uh, you would not just be able to use it. Right. 
So this, if you've seen it, this is just the first page, the left side of, of a, a patent, uh, arguably what people say the most valuable patent in the world. Uh, and the left side is one of the figures from it. This is actually the one-click patent from Amazon uh, that they filed in 97, just expired last September, to September 2017. Um, and you know, it's, it's, if you, you read through it, you know, and certainly in hindsight, it doesn't seem that complicated, but back in 1997, it was supposed, supposedly cutting edge technology. So, uh, so again, within patents, as Gita mentioned, there are three types. There's utility patents, design patents, and plant patents. Most people associate or think of utility patents, uh, which is a useful article, product, process, method of manufacture, um, something that you've created um, that gives a person a 20-year monopoly uh, to prevent other people from using that. Um, you have the right to prevent others from making, selling, using, importing, so you can stop someone from making it in a third country and importing it into the United States. Um, but the, the key thing, uh, to, as I mentioned, is a patent is a negative right. So just because you have a patent doesn't necessarily mean you can practice it. There could be superior users that you, we have to consider. Certainly if you were to improve upon the iPhone, you can't just start making iPhones with your improvement because Apple would take issue with that. So. Uh, there's also plant patents. Um, those are still somewhat prevalent. Um, I have not uh, seen one recently, but certainly if you think of the Roundup Ready chemicals that, or excuse me, Roundup Ready plants that Monsanto was making, um, and certainly, 100 years ago, when we were more agricultural society, there were a plethora of plant patents, but you know, the living organism must be asexually reproduced, not tuber ligated, or excuse me, propagated, um, and it has certain characteristics um, that are key to it. Yes? Is there a reason that that kind of has evolved like organism patents or something else so that it's more generalized for like living organisms as opposed to just plants, or is there like a historical reason that it's Um, I think still just going back to public policy that they, you, they don't want you to protect anything that's naturally present. So hopefully if you get a plant patent, you've created a plant that doesn't naturally exist on its own and you can't just um, go out and grow it. So the second one, you know, it's not too propagated and it's not found in an uncultivated state. So they don't want you to get a patent on um, you know, some plant that's just growing wild in, in some field that no one's ever seen. So. Uh, so that was a, a case Supreme Court decided, I believe it was the early 80s, for a, a bacteria. And it, it ultimately boils down to, could this, would you find this in, in nature? And if you can't and you show that it's a, a man-made product, then you can get a, a patent for it. Yeah, this happens, again, this is my yeah. field. It happens all of the, these are patents that happen all the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a company here that happened to start of RNA Agri, which is you know, making organisms that are used in fermentation to manufacture uh, agricultural products. And it's, you know, the patents issued, it's a uh, yeah, powerful patent. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really complicated because as some of you in the class know, there's a new technology called uh, CRISPR-Cas9, where it's then biologically impossible to determine whether the change in the organism happened naturally or by genetic engineering. And that's going to create a whole new set of challenges for patents in this area. So stay tuned to the challenge. <laughs> opportunities like uh, for our speaker to and others to make money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving along, design patents. Again, they are designed to protect the ornamental aspect of an invention. So uh, one of the earliest, most famous is the Coke bottle. You, at the time, you, you couldn't get a, get a patent for just a glass bottle, but this protects that shape. Um, you know, the hourglass shape with the, the ridges along the side. They're commonly used for jewelry, furniture, uh, running shoes, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, beverage containers, and the iPhone. A lot of the uh, subject matter for the iPhone 
Um, certainly the billion dollar litigation with Samsung revolved around design patents. So they're taking existing things, they just organize it in an ornamental way um, to make it more user friendly and, and there's a lot of value in that. So um, some of the clients I work with who you know, may not be able to patent their product in and itself and get the full coverage, they've certainly designed it in a way that has patentable protection. Um, you can also get to some functionality, kind of a backdoor way to functionality using your ornamental shape. You know, if it has a certain shape that performs a function, you just, you're just going for that ornamental shape itself and you don't really try to claim a triangular shaped bottle, sort of thing like that. Uh, so this is a design patent from the Nike Shocks shoe. Um, if you can see, so the, most of the shoe is in this broken line. So Nike's saying, we're not claiming that general shoe shape. We're really focused on this part right here. And that's just the look of that Shox portion itself. They also have patents on a fluid filled um, shoe absorption uh, component. I forgot the exact title of it, but they have several patents, utility patents on that as well. Um, but this is just a design patent. Uh, so within patents themselves, if any of you have started the process in the US, you may be familiar with a provisional patent, which is sometimes a placeholder. Um, it has a lot lower cost. It establishes priority that at least from this date, I invented this, filed it, and you have a year to follow up with a non-provisional. Um, and it's your non-provisional where you actually claim your invention, and that's what's examined by the patent office. So some people file provisional, paper, provisional applications that is just their article, just a drawing, something simple um, that's hopefully enabled to some extent, and then they spend that year either defining or uh, refining it, making it better, doing market studies, see if it's really worth pursuing, or just flushing out some of the details that they've had. Uh, and these can lead, the non-provisionals lead to divisionals, continuations, and what we call continuation of parts. That's where one application grows into a patent family, where in your written description, you can find four or five related inventions in there. Uh, sometimes they could, you could put in a totally unrelated one, but at least you've established priority to this day one, and then you build it out from there. Uh, so again, you know, using Nike as an example, they have several copyrights uh, for their advertisements and uh, some of their other written material. They certainly have trademarks, the swoosh, uh, the swoosh with their name. Uh, they have multiple patents, so I just identified two. Um, so yes, the fluid field support methods. They also have patents for methods of making them uh, and then several design patents. Uh, so as I mentioned, a patent, you get a mon monopoly by telling the world what you're doing, how to make this. Um, but again, you don't have to reveal every single detail of what parts you're using, what manufacturer they come from. So there is a trade-off to consider, you know, what you want to consider, keep trade secret, and what you want to actually file in the patent application. Um, so these are just some of the benefits between the two. If you do want to seek patent protection, whether you, or you want to keep your process or what you're doing as a secret. Uh, NDAs, uh, as Kid mentioned, and maybe Mark will touch upon, are, are very important. Again, when you're dealing with contractors, third parties, you want to protect your intellectual property um, and protect anything that you have as your own. And you, if it's you know, a mutual, you're going to you know, protect their information, they're going to protect yours, uh, and vice versa. Uh, so just you know, a little quiz. Keep you interested, if you had a marketing logo for your company, would you use that as a trade secret or would you try to seek patent protection for, or IP protection, I should say. Oh. Right. Uh, software used in the manufacturing process. So I would probably suggest that be a trade secret. That's something you're using to manufacture your product. Um, even if you're making something that exists, you've got a way to make it faster, more efficient, which you don't want your competitors to know. So. And now you can improve your business that way. Uh, brand associated ornamental device. Design patent, design patent correct. Uh, your unique product or service name. Trademark. trademark. Um, customer feedback data. Trade secret. Trade secret, correct. Uh, new software you use in a product. Trade secret. This one could actually be both. Uh, you could protect, try to protect the software that's out there because you know someone might likely reverse engineer it, so you at least want to protect yourself for, that, for the functionality of it while it's out there. Uh, conversely, if you kind of have a black box app, you really don't, you don't think your consumers are going to go through that trouble, 
you might keep it as a trade secret. To her question about the t-shirts earlier, so if you have a brand mm -hmm. and part of your brand is selling t-shirts with different slogans on them, mm -hmm. um, is each slogan a different copyright or how did, how, like, do you have to like write down each slogan and copyright that individually or does the t-shirt, does the slogan on the t-shirt become the copyright? The Each slogan would be a copyright. Okay, so that's so your... t-shirt bumper sticker, it yeah. doesn't matter, the slogan is Yes, that's where you were to get, that's your creative expression that's fixed in, in a written format. That's where you would seek patent protection, or excuse me, copyright protection for that. Uh, but again, if you, know, you have a t-shirt company and you want people to know that you make high quality t-shirts, that would be your company name that you would also trademark and that's what's going to be on the tag, the back of the neck or whatever when you sell it in the store. Yes? So, you're saying to copyright You, again, you can do both. So if, if your company name is just going to be on the shirt, you, it's, it, you could copyright your company name. I don't know how much value it is in whatever your company name is, but it would be a, a good marketing tool for the business behind it. So, so. not talking about company names, uh -huh. just talking about shirts. Uh -huh. Copyright. Now you could, again, you can do both. Primarily be copyright, but if you've come up with something clever and you're gonna build business around, you're gonna use it in other marketing campaigns, if it's gonna be kind of what people know you for, just this one shirt, then you would seek trademark protection for what other ventures you're, you're doing. So if you're gonna use that to form, um, so Nike has trademark and copyright for say, just do it. And you can build a, you know, people see just do it, they know it's a Nike product. It's, it identifies the source of everything else they're doing, whether it's shoe commercial, other apparel. Um, if it's just apparel, uh, you know, again, it ultimately gets into what, what your business is. If you, you want to identify your goods or services and the goodwill behind it. But if it's you just come up with something clever, a good expression, that would be something you want to copyright and, and license to have put on shirts. Mm -hmm. Can you copyright without paying? Because, like, with trademarking, this is like Tina, your mm -hmm. lifeboy, right? Like, you don't uh -huh. pay for it. But, like, do you have to pay for it? Uh, <clears throat> technically, no. So, copyrights and trademark, you can get a common law IP rights, which I mentioned maybe local, there's just this general region. So, you can get a trademark. Um, and you put TM next to it, and that'll give you trademark rights regionally in you know, the bi-state area or maybe surrounding states, depending on what you're doing. Um, and then you want to build you know, your secondary meaning behind that, so customers associate your brand with that. Um, register, federally register trademark, and you have the circle R, and that hopefully, you know, you've done your searching, if you get that, that means if you do want to go into New England or down to Florida, that you've, you know, no one else will be there. To, to impact your mark. Um, but, you know, it, it does exist. If you're using it to identify your company or your source of goods, it exists as it is just using the TM. Same thing with copyright, as soon as you write it down. Um, and while putting Circle C is a good um, practice step, it's technically not required anymore in the U.S. So if you do see someone else's art with, without the Circle C, it doesn't necessarily mean it's in the public domain. So just think of that if you want to borrow material from someone, but it is good, kind of good business practice for yourself to put Circle C after anything you create. Um, so like most property, patents, trademarks uh, can be assigned. So it's property you can assign to your company. You can sell if someone purchases your company. Uh, most employees and employment agreements have assignment rights to the company. Um, it's something you should consider because on a patent application, the employee would still be an inventor and they have certain rights during the process and anyone who invents any subject matter that makes it to a claim has rights to that patent. So you may have done all the work and I came up with one little piece that goes on one claim out of 20 and the patent issues and I'm a named inventor, I still have rights to the whole patent. So you want to make sure that everything's assigned to your company. As I said, it's usually built in in employment agreements um, that anything you develop here 
be a little belong to the company. Um, there's certain things of shop rights. If you develop something somewhere else, you know, they may not own it, but they may have the right to use it, if, unless these are some issues you've worked out ahead of time to avoid some headaches. Um, again, just more details for assignments. You want to try to capture everything you have, and we'll look over these if you're going to assign it to someone else. Licenses, briefly. Uh, I won't go into it too much. I believe Mark and his colleague are going to discuss it, but uh, you know, these are other ways you can get access to, to IP if you need someone else's technology to further your business instead of purchasing their patent, instead of just running the risk of stealing it, you can seek a license and ultimately most people are amenable to that because everybody uh, comes out ahead. So, uh, any other questions? Uh, um, yes. So I answered a co of some patents and I was a party uh, in a big company. Mm -hmm. So like you said, I won't have right to use because Mm -hmm. That's that's correct. If, um, you most likely assigned it yeah. to the company, so they they own it. Yeah. And, um, and then another question is, if I hire somebody to do the work and I file the patent, even though that person is the contractor, I'm not you know it's not a regular employee. Mm -hmm. and just collaboration or whatever, I still have to put that person in my uh, patent, right? Like um. That, we get into the nuance of what they do. If someone is just following your directions, developing something you told them, you conceived of, they would not be an inventor. Okay. If they, during the course of that, say, hey, why don't we try this, something else, then they could potentially be an inventor. But if you say, here's my invention, go make it, following my directions, right. they're not an inventor. Uh, if the protocol is set by me, uh -huh. okay. Yes. All right, I think uh, we're coming up against the break, so if you have any questions, I'll be around. Feel free to ask me. Uh, during the break.